Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2020 Georgia Legislative Policy Forum. I'm Kyle Wingfield. I'm the president and CEO of the Georgia Public Policy Foundation, and we thank you for joining us today. This is the fourth event of our revamped forum. Uh, we're halfway home. Uh, like so much in our society, we've had to adapt to the current circumstances. In fact, that's the theme for this year's event, Wisdom, Justice, Adaptation. Uh, as you probably know, that's a play off the state's motto, and we believe adaptation is the right focus for this year's sessions. If you missed the first three events about education and the budget, uh, including our opening keynote with U.S. Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos, you can find recordings on our YouTube channel, Georgia Policy. After today's panel, we'll be back here the next three Tuesdays at 11 a.m. to explore the ways Georgians are adapting to a changed world. We'll have panels of local and national experts talking about the economy, housing, and healthcare. We're grateful to be joined on this journey by some key sponsors without which our work would not be possible. They are our presenting sponsor, AT&T, platinum sponsors, Verizon and the Walton Family Foundation, and silver sponsor, the Georgia Association of Realtors. We thank each of them for their support of this event, uh, whereas tickets for our all-day Georgia Legislative Policy Forum in the past have cost about $100 per person, we're pleased to be able to offer this year's event of outstanding speakers uh, to you for no charge. Uh, we would, however, appreciate your voluntary support of our work, and you can visit georgiapolicy.org slash donation, or donate, excuse me, uh, to make a tax-deductible contribution. And during this morning's program and the ones that follow, we would like to hear questions from you in the audience. You can submit those to us in the chat or Q&A boxes on your screen. Just type your question in there and we'll try to get to as many as we can in the time we have. We have a great panel lined up to discuss uh, land use and transportation today, but first I want to start by welcoming Baruch Feigenbaum, Baruch is the Senior Managing Director of Transportation Policy for the Reason Foundation, and he's a senior fellow for us at the Georgia Public Policy Foundation. He's going to set the stage for today's discussion by sharing some data about how transportation, transportation usage and patterns have changed in recent months and in what ways they might bounce back. So, Baruch? All right. Well, thank you very much, Kyle, and it's great to be here, and I'm thankful that everyone in the audience was able to join us as well. What I want to go ahead and do, as Kyle mentioned, is set, a, set the overview. What's going on in Georgia? How has COVID changed? What's happening in Georgia? And what we can be looking forward to, or maybe not looking forward to, in the years ahead. So the biggest thing I would say is that while transportation might not be the first thing that folks think of when they think of effects of COVID, COVID has had a big effect. Um, automobile use has declined about 7%. Uh, long haul truck traffic actually 2 to 3%. It's a little less, but the commuting is down obviously as more people are working from home. Transit use has declined about 75%. Express bus more than local. Air travel has been the, the big, I don't know if we want to call it loser, but the one that's really declining about 85%. And what we're seeing is an increase in multi-generation families and an interest in suburban and exurban development. There's been quite a lot of promotion of the back to the city movement over the last 10 years, and that's not gonna go away, but we are seeing some different preferences, even expressed by millennials who have been more interested in going back to the city than other groups. Some commute changes could, might be permanent. So working from home, for example, we think could double from six to 12%, particularly in Metro Atlanta, a little less so in some of the other Georgia regions. Uh, the automobile mode split has increased with COVID, uh, there's been decreases in transit, cycling and walking have ticked up slightly. And then we think that a development of a vaccine therapeutic uh, and, and when we get back to in-person school across the board is going to have a significant effect on reversing some of these things. The, the bad potential news is there's a little less revenue because of course people are driving less, uh, but it's also easier to construct roads um, maintain and build them because less traffic means lanes can be closed during rush hour and other periods. In terms of Georgia, in terms of Georgia trends, sometimes I, I think it's important to say we are going to solve COVID. It can be a little depressing from day to day, but we will get there. And we think that traffic congestion and the problems with mobility are once again 
going to become a problem in 2019 before COVID. NREX ranked Atlanta 10th worst in the U.S. in congestion. Drivers losing 82 hours per year in the overall congestion costs of more than $1,214 per driver. We have some issues with transit services. I think we've, we've seen that before in terms of being poorly coordinated. And I would add too much focus on the choice rider, that is folks who have another way of getting around, usually via car, as opposed to the transit dependent rider, which is, tends to be folks with slightly lower incomes. We're seeing improved broadband even before COVID with working from home going up. And then there's some zoning challenges that I know some of our land use speakers are going to talk about, um, be they single family residential, straight commercial, little mixed use, few variances, uh, not a lot of ability to do some innovation in uh, terms of land use. So Georgia's rankings in the annual hire report. So overall, Georgia's middle of the pack. Uh, the state does pretty well in most rankings, particularly urban arterial pavement where it's 14th. Uh, we struggle a little bit in traffic congestion, probably no surprise to anyone where we're 47th. Um, fatality rate's a little high, but actually relatively good for a state that's relatively rural um, outside Atlanta. So overall, GDOT is doing a good job, but of course there's always room for improvement uh, in terms of reducing congestion and then getting those pavement quality, especially on the interstate rankings, a little bit higher. Georgia's fallen slightly in those over about the last five years. So I would say the overall context is that the state highway ranking, I would label it fair to good. Now the local roads, the local county and city roads, I think there's more room for improvement. You may have noticed when you're driving along, you get onto more of a local road, the pavement quality is not as good. And I think we're, we're starting to see that more and more of a problem. And so we need to look at that. I would say our overall revenues are, are adequate. Um, I am never a person that advocates increasing taxes and I don't think it's something we need to now. Uh, the mix of gas taxes, tolling, uh, county sales taxes seem to be fine. If there is a major drop off in driving, there could be some challenges, but I'm not seeing that coming down. I think uh, folks are adjust, adjusting pretty well. And then, the decline in transit fare box revenue is a bit of an issue. So transit is subsidized, uh, heavily subsidized most transit systems. And so with people using them even less and with some agencies not collecting fares, the revenue problem is becoming real. And I think what we need to do is look at some innovative approaches in terms of how we can go ahead and solve those problems, which leads me to the last part here, which is some recommendations. And so I know Tom is going to talk about the managed lane network. I think we need to prioritize construction of that. Uh, State Road 400 I-285 north and managed lanes were pushed back a little bit. Now that was because Georgia's got a lot of needs. And so GDOT is working on widening I-85 in uh, Gwinnett and further out. And also on uh, the I-75 truck lanes between Macon and the South Atlanta suburbs. Those are really important too. But I think we need to find a way to speed up some of these projects. I would also note that that State Road 400 project has a bus rapid transit system that I think is going to be real impressive and is going to show folks that bus rapid transit could be just as good as rail, uh, which I think is important for uh, some folks to uh, understand, shall I say. Uh, we also need a little better coordination between GDOT, the county, and the city on arterial highways. And this can be a bit of a challenge because cities don't tend to like folks from other jurisdictions traveling through them. And so they can sometimes try to slow traffic, understand from a local perspective, but we also have to look at the region. We have to look at the economic needs at the folks that people are in best, in, in best shape economically when they actually can reach a circle of jobs that is as large as possible and employers are in the best shape when they can reach the most number of employees. In terms of the transit, uh, we need to redesign the agencies. So, uh, and I'm just using MART as an example, I'm not picking on them, but so transit agencies are coordinators instead of service operators. We'd like to see a little more contracting service, partnering with ride sharing companies, private operators, Cobb and Gwinnett, I believe are still contracting their transit service. I'd, I'd like to see MARTA do a little bit more of that. Um, also looking at partnerships with Uber and Lyft, which MARTA does have in microtransit. Encouraging some more public-private partnerships, GDOT skinning, going on its first full P3, which is the State Road 400 managed lanes. 
Uh, we need to see some more of those to bring private capital in. Uh, innovative delivery methods. Both Florida and Virginia have done something called fence defense contracting, where they will contract out maintaining the right of ways, so mowing the grass, for example, on the highways. And the private sector has sort of an innovative approach here where they measure the grass and only mow it when it's a certain height as opposed to just doing it on a fixed schedule. Uh, we also want to relax some of the zoning rules, particularly that prevent Airbnb rentals and granting flats, and then also make sure that the urban growth boundaries are prevented uh, because that's a big factor in raising housing costs. If you look at some other metro areas, Washington, D.C., for example, housing can be about twice the cost and a large factor for that is urban growth boundaries. So that's my overview. Let me go ahead and stop now and turn it back over to Kyle or Ashley. Thank you, Baruch. That was, uh, that was great. Good overview. Get us uh, the, that background for the discussion that we need. Um, would like now to turn things over to our moderator for this morning's panel, Ashley Jenkins. She's the Director of Government Affairs for the American Council of Engineering Companies in Georgia. Uh, before she begins, let me remind everyone that you can find a link to our program with our panelists' full bios on our homepage, georgiapolicy.org. We won't go through all those uh, right now in the interest of time, uh, but you can find that all there. And so, Ashley, let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, Baruch, that was a great overview. I have no more questions. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I did want to introduce our panelists. We have Adam Hingles who is the founder of the Center for Market Urbanism, Joel Kotkin of Chapman University and the Urban Reform Institute and executive editor of newsography.com. We have Tom Hutchinson, transportation director at HNTV, who's in charge of the MMIP program here in Georgia. Uh, T. Dallas Smith of the Georgians First Commission and the T. Dallas Smith and Company Commercial Real Estate. So I want to welcome all our panelists. We really appreciate you taking the time to come on today. Um, uh, the Atlanta Regional Commission did a survey back at the end of April, uh, 3,000 people who work in Atlanta about their previous and current work arrangements. And those results were published this past week. At the time, the respondents were working from home an average of 4 to 4.6 days a week. Most respondents did not want to return to working at work, but not, I mean, they did want to return, but not full time. People told the ARC they wanted to work from home an average of two to two and a half days a week. That's a 213% increase from pre-pandemic levels. The survey also polled execs from a number of the state's largest employers, including Coca-Cola, Cox, Georgia Power, Primerica, and State Farm. Before the pandemic, less than 5% of these companies' workforces participated in telework. By the end of March, some 90% were working from home. 69% said, these are of the execs, 69% said they believed that more employees would work from home in the future, with 23% saying that more employees would work full-time teleworking. So that's a huge change. That's a sea change, 23% full-time working from home. So if folks are telecommuting two and a half days a week, what does that do to the, our landscape? And I know Barack or Baruch went over some of that, but on, from a residential housing um, needs and policies, I don't know, Joel, do you wanna speak to that? How you think that's gonna impact residential housing? And then we'll go to commercial real estate and then transportation. Well, okay. Um a couple of quick, you know, quick things. One, many of the trends that we're seeing now were already in place before COVID. That's um, uh, New York, Chicago, LA, all losing population, millennials moving into the suburbs. You know, their biggest problem is they can't afford it um, in, in, in some cases. Um, migration, interestingly, to um, in the last few years, what's been really a, a huge change is we went from a period where people are going to the big metros, now they're going to the smaller metros, and they're also going to the suburbs. And that's all census data. That's not narrative. That's, that's what is. Now we can now start to speculate about what's going to happen next. It would seem to me that one, you're going to continue to see the trends which were already in place. Um, and I think that the I think there's going to be, and, and this we're getting from real estate agents that we're talking to around the country, and AEI has done it. There is a greater interest in 
affordable and somewhat more space um, and that people will be moving, uh, seem to be wanting to move either to smaller communities or to the suburbs. That doesn't mean there isn't going to be a group who are going to want to live in the, in the city. There's, you know, people in their twenties and, and very wealthy who can opt out of all the problems that cities bring with them. Um, and then there are going to be people who simply are stuck there and, or have reasons why they can't go. Um, I do think that the real crisis is going to be on commercial real estate. One, I, the retail uh, apocalypse is going to continue. It's, it was already happening. And I'm sure we're all very pleased to know that Jeff Bezos keeps getting richer. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, you couldn't have designed a better crisis for him. Um, but then I think that, that you're going to see um, office buildings, um, are going to have a real problem. I was just checking uh, one of the big office buildings downtown Los Angeles. Um, I'm I'm in Southern California. Um, sold for ab about thirty five percent less than than a year ago. Well, what the price was a year ago. So the reality is, it's going to be very difficult to, to do big office buildings with social distancing. You're going to have to have some of your employees work elsewhere. The idea of the big open office with everybody on top of each other, I think that's not going to be too popular in the near future. Um, so I think you're going to see acceleration of trends that already existed, but also some great opportunities. But the biggest one I see for cities and even suburban areas is the redevelopment of uh, redundant um, uh, retail space and to some extent office space. I mean, right now, for instance, in the lockdown, we're at Chapman starting to discuss how our students can start working in on the small pods of the kids um, from disadvantaged families and how to get them uh, space. And I can tell you, getting space right now is really easy. Adam, did you want to add to that? Yeah, sure. I think there, there are a few trends. I, I think one thing that's going to be important, even if we get back to a new normal that looks somewhat similar to the old normal, even in that case, we can't unsee some of the things that we've seen. And that includes, you know, an increase in working from home. Um, so I think that's a trend that has only been accelerated. Um, you know, I think, um, yeah, I think there, there may be shifts away from the, the high rise downtown towards the more uh, neighborhood centers. I think, uh, you know, I think people may not be necessarily, or, or urban dwellers such as myself, we, we may not be necessarily seeking uh, space for the sake of sa space. But what I am seeing is people saying, well, if I'm gonna be working from home all of this time, I would like a space that's more suited to, you know, how I'm working now. Uh, whether that means just having another office or uh, another room for an office or, you know, conveniences nearby that you can walk to that you would typically have nearby the office, maybe the Starbucks convenience stores nearby uh, that you can just, you know, take a quick walk to while you're taking your break. I think those are, um, you know, some shifts that we'll see. I think overall for um, for Atlanta, it's, it's I, I think this is going to be overall you know, positive for um, for population growth. I think you'll you'll see a lot of people dispersing away from expensive cities that are just you know uh, uh, absurdly expensive, like Silicon Valley, or San Francisco. Uh, if they can do their job remotely, why not live in Atlanta? And you know, of course, there's a, the trend that here in Chicago we've already seen. Uh, you know, the number one place. Um, you know, people are leaving Chicago to go to is Atlanta. So I think that'll continue. And I, I think, you know, that's overall good for Atlanta. It's, it's a matter of, um, you know, it's going to be up to Atlanta and Georgia to make sure that the policies that they have are, are accommodating to new people. Do you think it could have the unintended effect of creating more sprawl in Atlanta? Uh, well, if, I mean, I, I guess, it certainly could. Um, if you spend money on high on new highways instead of fixing the ones that are you know already need fixing, uh, as well as you know keeping the if, if zoning stays 
uh, restrictive uh, in the Atlanta area and nearby, uh, it's going to be hard to build anywhere except for sprawl. So yeah, it's going to be up to cities to, you know, make sure that their uh, zoning uh, zoning is not prohibiting new people from coming to the area. Um, Dallas, could you address how that's going to impact commercial real estate or what you, the trends you're seeing in Atlanta? Absolutely. Um, first of all, thanks for having me on the panel. And um, we're a little different here in Atlanta. What I'd say in terms of what we're seeing is national trends. Uh, just recently, you know, Microsoft took um, 523,000 square feet in Midtown, which represented the largest transaction that's happened since COVID. Um, and, it, and it happened in Atlanta for a couple of reasons. One, the diverse workforce and relatively, you know, when you compare Los Angeles or Chicago, the real estate's relatively inexpensive. Um, you sell a house in Chicago, uh, a little duplex in Chicago, you move to Atlanta, you can live in a, uh, a mansion just about. So we're, we're seeing a lot of that happen. And um, we're also seeing sort of what I'd say sort of early adopters into communities. Uh, where uh, one of my favorite sayings, Ross Perot said years ago, always buy in the inevitable path of growth. And, and Herman Russell said, buy it when it's ugly. So I just put both of them together, buy it when it's ugly in the inevitable path of growth. And so we're seeing a lot of that happen now. But what that takes is particularly from the millennials who are not afraid of anything. That's why they're still out during the COVID. But uh, they, they don't mind being the first in the communities as well. And so... It's, it's ugly, but it's also at a, pri at a price point where they can buy it. So how does that impact commercial real estate? It gets them closer to the bodies. That's one of the reasons uh, Microsoft wanted to be in Atlanta, really to be close to talent. And so I think we're going to see more of that, particularly in Atlanta. And we're going to see a return to, I've been in commercial real estate now since 1982. When I got into the business in 1982, the typical person put uh, that was used per user was around 250 square feet per person. Uh, this is the rah-rah 80s. Uh, Reagan was president. Uh, money was flowing. And then everything went back to this sort of open environment. Let's get everybody closer. So we went from 250 to I've had, we've had a federal government uh, uh, client that went down to 83 square feet per person. So I think what COVID has done is it's exposed us to hey, okay, it's probably not a good idea to have everybody just sitting on top of each other. So let's get, make sure that we plan six feet as a minimum, what the distance will be. If we're gonna be in an open environment, with, even with the shields and that kind of thing. But I'm also seeing a return to private offices uh, because everybody can't work at home. I'm working at home right now. And this is a good day because my daughter just started school again. So she's upstairs in one room. My wife's upstairs in the other room. I'm relegated to the kitchen. So that's why I had to do the fake background because I didn't want you to have to look at the kitchen. But <laughs> I see, uh, and I think Adam made a uh, point to, I think we're going to see builders start to build homes um, with the traditional offices, but with more commercial upgrades to networks. Uh, because I'm sure we've all experienced I swear everybody's on the call at exactly the same time. So you get this, you know, the static thing, but uh, more of a commercial uh, trunk line, I think is what you're going to start seeing coming to homes, not just the residential. Uh, so hopefully that answers the question. Yes, absolutely. Right. And, and on to transportation, Tom, what, what do you think will happen with transportation priorities? Um, we talked about the express lanes and the BRT. We've got the managed lanes that are coming, top end. Um, we, we know that there are truck lanes that we're looking at from Macon to Atlanta. Do you think that there's gonna be some shifting of priorities at the state level? Absolutely, and, and thanks Ashley for the question. Um, certainly do think we're gonna see some reprioritization moving forward. Um, you know, for those familiar with the uh, Atlanta metro market, you know, the Georgia DOT, State Road and Tollway Authority are uh, making a significant investment um, in priced express lane projects uh, in metro Atlanta. And it's not just in Atlanta, um, in urban areas around the country, um, you know, those investments have been uh, prioritized uh, where, you know, where you see that kind of 
reoccurring acute uh, congestion in peak periods. So uh, places in South Florida, the Mid-Atlantic, uh, West Coast, of course, uh, Texas, and, and other urban areas are contemplating those types of solutions. Uh, not only do they provide benefits um, you know, to, to passenger vehicles, but they, they can also serve as uh, veritable uh, really fixed guideways for, for rapid transit service as well. Um, so it, coming up into 2020, uh, many areas were prioritizing uh, those types of projects. You know, there's still a lot of value uh, in those projects. Um, you know, as we think about as we think about peak period congestion coming back, um, you know, they'll continue to perform uh, as they were intended to perform. Um, but I think there's other opportunities uh, to explore with these assets. And, you know, one of the things that we're hearing about um, is, is managed lanes that are separated uh, some, in some way physically from, uh, from the adjacent lanes being a, a test bed for connected uh, vehicles, for automated vehicle technologies and applications. Uh, and that's certainly something, um, you know, something to consider, uh, you know, moving forward as we think about uh, kind of the technological wave uh, that's coming, uh, that's changing the, the transportation space. Well, and to that point, um, freight and logistics is so huge here in Georgia for multiple reasons. I mean, the port, the airport, um, just we're just a hub for all of that. And I think Joel mentioned it earlier who's who's really making out on this. I mean, I have boxes delivered to my house every single day. And when we do think yeah. about the freight and logistics changes, the retail stores going under, uh, or the, you know, the brick and mortar going under, everybody buying online, how did those changes, if you're not taking the truck to the big box store, but it's coming on your street to your house to deliver you your little package, what does that do to the freight and logistics um, network in in the state sure and that and that's multimodal right so we think yeah. about uh, high valued freight traveling you know via um you know via air and then of course the the rail network that um, overlaps with our roadway network um and and of course thinking about the port of savannah uh and the tremendous growth anticipated there with freight um you know goods deliveries throughout this half of the united states um I mean, that, that's it's going to be huge, and I know that the Georgia legislature is is looking into that now, uh, is investigating, um, you know, not only the problem statement, uh, but also, um, you know, beginning to think about uh, funding options uh, to help get out in front of what we know is coming uh, as it relates to a huge, um, you know, influx of, of freight movement. Um, you know, some of the some of the short uh, short trips that you're seeing, of course, with with uh, Amazon trucks and others, um, uh, you know, it, it's it's adding to um, you know local street uh, network congestion. Uh, in addition to those long haul kind of interstate movements um, into and, and and through our state. Um, Dallas or anybody, do you think that um, because you're seeing the shift to where it just comes up to your doorstep? We'll see some of the uh, commercial real estate transition into distribution centers, or what? What do you think that means for commercial real estate? Industrial uh, landlords are doing extremely well right now, and so and they'll continue to do uh, very well. And we're seeing repurposing of some buildings that have been sort of uh, brick and mortar stores being turned into sort of last mile. Uh, relocation uh, facility. So I think you're going to see more and more of that. I, and I've had conversations with some local cities who uh, just don't want to see warehouses, right? And so I've had conversations with them. I won't name them. But the cities that I've named, I said, okay, first of all, you're near the busiest airport in the world. Mm -hmm. And so you're doing yourself a disservice if you're trying to look like everybody else. Uh, again, I've been a real estate guy a long time, and I, I really firmly believe that the dirt will tell you what it needs to be. You know, if you've ever seen that store that, you know, just never worked, you know, one day it was a laun you know, laundry place, and the next day it was something else, and finally something sticks and it stays there a long time. I'm a big believer that the dirt will tell you what it needs to be. And if you're near the business airport on the globe, on the planet, you need to think about logistics as a core look. I mean, so you won't have the hotel in your neighborhood, so you won't have the the fancy retail, but I, what you will have is a sustainable uh, tenant who can be there a very long time and provide employment 
as well as our, you know, you're going to have some retail that will uh, take care of that. And I think you're going to even start seeing some industrial spaces that will have that Starbucks thing up front, will have, uh, that will function a little bit more like a warehouse slash <laughs> retail mall for those things that you can't get. You, can, you still, unfortunately, you still can't get a haircut online. Um, you know, there's certain things you still can't do that I think you're gonna, with these large conglomeration of people coming together, you're gonna start seeing sort of retail tied to even some industrial space that you wouldn't have ever seen before. But um, I think it's something that's got legs um, and that can stick. Again, you've got to, everybody's not gonna have a Ritz Carlton in their neighborhood. Everybody's not gonna have a, a Bones or, you know, you're not. So listen to what the, the dirt really should be telling you and what you should have. And so, again, I'm, I'm fortunate that say, you know, I'm Atlanta born, Atlanta bred. When I died, the Atlanta did. So I'm, I'm, I'm blessed to be in Atlanta, uh, home of the busiest airport in the world. And these cities that are close to it, I think they're doing themselves a disservice if they don't really lean in on the industrial space and really all they could really be. That doesn't, it doesn't have to be your granddad's. Uh, industrial warehouse. It, it, it can be different. Joel, Adam, Barack, do y'all have anything to add to what Dallas just said? Well, I could just say, you know, briefly that uh, A, um, he, um, I think Dallas is right. I, I've even been reading that in New York City, in Manhattan, they're now building warehouses in Manhattan, which is something I never wow. thought you would see <laughs> um, because of the ex same factors. Um, I think there are, there are going to be other options. Um, one um, that I see, um, uh, one of the one of the smartest guys I know in real estate is out buying suburban and exurban um, deserted retail space and turning it into socially distanced offices. Because if oh. the dirt is cheap, then you can build those, and that way you have. And this is something that we're you know because you know I live in Looney Land, so it's hard to get anything sensible going, but. <laughs> But, 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 but one of the things that you could, you could see, and it's very clear, is that you could have, um, let's, say, let's say here in California, the state wants everybody, all the businesses to be clustered where it's incredibly expensive and congested, you know, usual brilliance. Um, but actually you have places like the Inland Empire where you could build um, not just warehouses, but, but this new kind of flexible office, um, uh, office space that you can't do in a downtown high rise, which is just too expensive. So I think there are gonna be a lot of uh, repositioning. The other thing just to raise very quickly is with, that um, if the reshoring movement continues, I think there may be some new opportunities on the, uh, on the front of, uh, of industrial and distribution um, also. So I think you know, what Dallas is saying, I think that the distribution industrial market I think is going to be really, really strong and, um, and is a place of great opportunity, particularly for a place like Atlanta that is relatively um, inexpensive. Adam Baruch. I would, I would just add that I think Dallas's point about the airport and using it more wisely is really important. For the longest time, it's sort of just been down there, and it's the, they like to call it now the most traveled airport in the world, but it was almost divorced from the rest of the city the opportunities for logistics and industrial, and I know they've got the Aerotropolis concept now, are just limitless. And it would really bring something to Atlanta that we don't have. And it's something for the region to think about and the city of Atlanta as well. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think it's an interesting shift. It's almost a complete sh paradigm shift over the past few decades. Um, you know, logistics and industrial facilities have been almost locate, you know, not very sensitive to location. They're willing to drive a few more extra miles to get the trucks to where they need to because the marginal cost of, of driving that truck is, is negligible. Um, and then, so to, to now see that shift that they are becoming more location sensitive, sensitive and you're seeing it in Manhattan and other places uh, is, is something to definitely take note of. Uh, I guess, you know, another thing that came to my mind is, you know, with, with increased uh, use of um, data at home, uh, I, I would expect also the need for infrastructure around data centers and other things 
that are going to need to accommodate that shift from commercial use of data to you know more dispersed use of data. Um, make one really quick point, sure. um, which is I think that what we're going to see in cities is I think the incredible concentrations I think are, are not really sustainable in the ma the manner that they're done. But moving things, uh, I think, as Adam suggested, into the neighborhoods, like for instance, why isn't there just a thriving office commercial market in Brooklyn? The, the talent is there. People don't really enjoy the subway. I grew up on the subway, so I'm not saying it's something necessarily bad. But let's face it, people don't want to do it. So I think cities are going to have to go back to their more decentralized historic routes. If you if you, you, you know, I've you know, done a lot of urban history and, you know, if you go to Tokyo, London, they're really not, they don't really have downtowns in the sense that we do. They have various different centers. I think we have to move in that direction. And particularly as an old New Yorker, as you can tell from my accent, um, you know, why not develop some innovative office, commercial, even industrial space in Brooklyn or, or, or Queens? which would also allow people to have shorter commutes and that we could use some of the new technologies to get people around instead of a subway system. To that point, we have had several questions uh, brought up about transit. As was mentioned earlier, brought, uh, Baruch said that transit is off, what, 85%? It's um, about 85%, yeah. Yeah, it's about off 85%. Um, what are y'all's thoughts on, is it gonna come back? Um, and if it does, are, are we still needing to build more heavy rail or is the future the bus rapid transit? And Tom, I'll let you start and then we can hear, since we have folks from other Chicago and, and LA, I'd like to hear y'all's response too. But Tom, can you take a gander at that? Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly think about this from the perspective of two different markets, right? I mean, the, uh, the choice rider and then the, you know, more of the transit dependent rider, um, you know, and, and the need, um, you know, the need for transit, the need for transit investment is not, not going away. You know, MARTA is thinking about, you know, in their capital program, um, different modes and for different places that make sense in different geography for different reasons. Um, and I think just maintaining that flexibility, that thinking about uh, prioritizing in your capital work program, um, you know, different modes to meet these different reasons is, is appropriate and, and timely. You know, I, we certainly, um, you know, moving forward, we'll certainly see a much different perspective on, on work from home, you know, post this, um, you know, gigantic social experiment we're all a part of right now. But, you know, the, the need for, for relationships and the need for face-to-face -face contact is not going away, um, and, you know, in spite of the virus. Uh, and and transit will be back. I'm very bullish about um, you know uh, uh, about that. I think it, it might look a little bit different uh, in the short term, but um, you know certainly need to um, you know need to keep our our minds open to significant uh, transit investment and the need for that uh, moving forward in our in our urban areas. Adam, what can you bring us insight from uh, Chicago? Well, I, I think. Um... Now, here in Chicago, I think we're seeing, you know, congestion getting back to normal levels of, and, and um, or, you know, what we've seen in the past and the amount of time I'm spending in rush hour sitting in traffic, you know, when I have to get somewhere is similar to what I used to. Um, and, and I attribute that basically because nobody's taking the train right now. So, you know, I think it's less of a problem in, in Georgia and Atlanta, but, you know, it's something to think about, like how, how much of the congestion alleviation is simply due to the fact that most people that are working in downtown Chicago are taking the train, whether it's a commuter train or the subway to work. And uh, so, you know, if, if that pattern stays where people aren't taking a public transportation system of some sort, then the traffic is just going to be gnarly. Um, but uh, it's hard, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to predict how that that'll play out. So I like to try, take my sort of try answering this question. It's a pretty hard answer. And 
I'll wrap in one of your earlier questions, Ashley, because I think it's important. And that was the question going back to sprawl. So and I'll, let me do that and then I'll get to the transit because they're related. So in terms of the sprawl, um, first we have to ask ourselves, is sprawl always a bad thing? The problem with sprawl would be the negative externalities, be they traffic congestion, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera. Uh, the Atlanta Regional Commission has a pretty interesting approach here, and they're trying to create sort of communities all over the Atlanta metro area, because downtown Atlanta has a relatively small share of the jobs. The perimeter area, Sandy Springs and Dunwoody, has by far the, mo the most, if, if you break them down into sub areas. And so we need to think about realistically where people are going to live and where they're going to work. And this was happening even before COVID. And now with COVID, with more people, certainly not everyone, but more people having the ability to work from home, the length of the trip to work is somewhat less important. And I bring this up for transit because when you look at transit, there's two different types of metro areas in the country. There's what we call the transit legacy cities, which are New York, Chicago, Washington, DC, San Francisco, Philadelphia, and Boston. It's always a challenge to remember them all. And then the rest of the cities, which were built post-World War II. And in those legacy cities, transit tends to work better, particularly rail transit, because there's a larger share of the jobs in downtown. In Atlanta, where the jobs are so dispersed, that's one of the reasons why I personally am in favor of bus and BRT, just because they can take advantage of the roadway network and the expressway network in order to do that. Um, and another thing that transit can use, and, and I know we're working on, is these managed lanes and pricing, because we found that pricing can reduce congestion and if you give priority to the transit buses. Now, that's not to say that the, the north-south, uh, but the red line from MARTA doesn't make some sense. It's just a question of whether we're going to build more of that or whether we're going to focus on bus and BRT. That's, that's a great point. Great point. Um, do you think this is a question from the audience? Do you think that this is going to um, accelerate the development of self-driving autos? Um, well, I was about to bring that up anyway. So, uh, okay. so because, uh, in, in the work that I, I do with, uh, I, I do a lot of work with uh, over the past in uh, with MIT and there. So we're dealing with that. I mean, I think you're going to see, um, I've, I see it in certain stages. One is, an, um, and I think Baruch uh, mentioned it in his presentation, the use of, of dial-a-ride services. It could be Uber, it could be Lyft, it could be, it could be something else where people can call up and, and go from point to point. Um, in Anaheim, we discussed uh, with the city the idea of actually having a, a dial-a-ride service for, let's say, in the, when Disneyland was open, uh, where people could go to, Dis you know, who work in Disneyland in working class areas, predominantly Latino, those areas, uh, it would be infinitely more efficient for everybody and cost wise if they literally just had a dial -a ride service. Um, so that's the first step. Autonomous is the next step after the dial -a ride. Um, and because we have to realize, as I, has been mentioned, people are moving in a million different directions. 80% of commutes in America from suburb to suburb. Really not practical to deal with, with uh, fixed rail transit. And so we ought to take advantage of what technology can do, not just telecommuting, but also on the autonomous side. And also when you mentioned uh, trucks uh, and logistics, uh, sure. Dallas, I spent some time, I think you'd be interested in this, at J.B. Hunt oh, uh, yes. in Fayetteville. Yes. And I can tell you, they've got a huge group of people there. The trucks are going to go autonomous, I think, faster than the cars. Mm. And then ideas about, well, maybe we want to have truck lanes for those autonomous vehicles because we don't maybe want to mix them with people who are making the usual human decisions. Um, so I think there's a, one of the things that I would love to see is transit agencies to start look beyond 19th century, early 20th century solutions and start to look at the solutions that make sense for the vast majority of America, which is A, not legacy cities, and even the vast majority of the legacy cities are themselves dispersed. You know, the New York and Boston metropolitan areas are actually incredibly dispersed. Um, so I just would like to see more focus on the, the possibilities that the new technology has given us. The expansion of telecommuting should wake us up to the idea that out of, out of this kind of crisis, we can reach solutions that are environmentally and socially beneficial. 
Thank you for that, Joel. Uh, another question from the audience was, uh, with the trends in industry and distribution create more of a need for a second airport in Atlanta uh, to accommodate the freight? And I haven't thought about that. That was not part of it. I've been involved because I work for engineers. I've been involved in the Freight and Logistics Commission year one, but that question actually didn't come up all year. So I don't know if Tom or y'all want to or Dallas, if you want to touch on that, if you think that that increases the need for a second airport? I think uh, Hartsville, uh, there's so much freight moving out of Hartsville right now. They, in fact, when I first got in the real estate business, I was located right off Virginia Avenue, worked for Tommy Tiff, and we were just at the beginning of the, uh, the old entrance to the old airport. I don't know if you, if you remember. So it's, his property was the only one that was really kind of out of the flight path. And so that entire area was focused on cargo. And so, uh, you know, a lot of times we're on these planes, you know, just taking vacations and doing whatever. We don't realize we're also going along with some freight. <laughs> so I think I'd, I'd hate to see another airport just dedicated to, car, to cargo. I think it just adds more to the tra uh, traffic and everything else. And I think um, the capacity that Hartfield has is, and I don't know, the, if some folks on this call may know a lot better, but it's a huge number. Uh, I know, I think Chicago was number one in freight and uh, I think Atlanta was number two. And I mean, we, with Chicago, we've gone back and forth, whether it was people or, or packages. Uh, but I think Hartsfield's doing a great job at that. And I, and I, don't, I don't see another need for just a airport that's purely for cargo. Or Tom, did, did y'all? Yeah, I, I think it's, I, th I think it's a great question. I, I mean, I think I could fill the shelf with second airport studies, uh, you know, in, in, in Metro Atlanta. Um, you know, you, Dobbins, PDK, uh, you know, Gwinnett. I mean, what, um, yeah. you know, there, there's, been a, there's been a tremendous amount of effort given to look at that exact issue for that exact reason. Um, you know, Hartsfield Jackson has an um, extensive capital program in place to help alleviate some of these future bottlenecks uh, for both passengers and freight. Um, but I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's a great question. I, I don't have a good answer. So to put a point on what Tom said, the Atlanta region needs a second airport. We are by far the largest metro area in the country with it, without two airports. But there are some folks who benefit from the Hartsville Jackson Airport. They're not super excited for us to have a second airport. And there are some challenges with citing it. Nobody wants to live near an airport. Um, I actually think Dobbins Field, because it's military and the runways tend to be longer, is intriguing, but there's some flight space issues. Um, in terms of freight, I mean, we, as, as Dallas mentioned, we do a pretty good business in Atlanta. It kind of depends if you measure how much freight the passenger carriers do or how much freight just FedEx and UPS do, because in strictly those, places like Anchorage and Memphis do better. Uh, I think there is room um, for more freight, but we are somewhat, somewhat restricted in Atlanta. They, they've done a lot to try to improve the airspace and have less spacing between planes landing and taking off. Uh, we'll see. Right now, of course, with the less aviation traffic, there's no problem. If that continues, it uh, doesn't ramp up as much. But if we get back to the point in time where we have, you know, up to 100 flights taking off an hour and we've got, uh, you know, 110 million passengers going through, which is more flights, it's certainly something we ought to relook at. Well, you know, if you want to see what that really looks like at the end of the day, uh, fly to Memphis, and you realize that FedEx, that, that airport should just be called FedEx. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the majority of the traffic that comes out of the, the Memphis airport, and FedEx is a client of mine, so let me, let me uh, full disclosure, I, I'm, I'm grateful that they're moving a lot of freight. <laughs> but you, you go to Memphis, it, it, you, it, you can, it looks like a cargo airport uh, with a few people flying. Uh, and it's, but I, I think the idea, Baruch, I love the idea of um, Dobbins or maybe, you know, someplace that already exists and they're trying to figure out something to do with it. Um, I just, I just, more traffic in Atlanta, you know, <laughs> that's. <laughs> I live in Cobb, so I'm not super stoked yeah. about putting it at Dobbins. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Um, maybe Paulding County or so, I don't know. Right. Um, <laughs> 
well, we're running up on the end, and I just wanted to throw this out for the panelists. If you want to just give us your last thoughts, um, what what do you think the pandemic has taught us about cities and land use policy? Adam, I'll start with you. Sure. Yeah, I guess um, so. To stick with the the theme of this forum, you know, on adaptation, you know, I think the biggest thing we can learn from a land use point of view is that uh, being nimble is, is important, you know, having, you know, a one size fits all solution for, for all of the zoning and land use across the whole area, you know, doesn't provide the flexibility you need to be able to, you know, handle unexpected situations like this. You know, for example, I think, uh, I know I'm, I'm breaking the law right now I'm, I'm doing business in a residential zone and a, and a lot of people out there are, are, you know, willingly breaking the law right now. It just goes to show, you know, how use based zoning is, you know, outdated and no longer really belongs in a society that needs to be able to handle situations like this. Um, you know, so, you know, and I think in general, I, I remember, in my past life, I was a structural engineer. And uh, after 9-11, you know, everyone said, well, we'll never build another skyscraper. That's the skyscrapers are dead, but yet the skyscrapers came back. So I think there, there will be like a new normal that will look somewhat similar to the old normal, but some things we just won't be able to unsee, you know, but I think, you know, with that in mind, you know, I don't, we just, we want to be careful not to overreact to the situation because we just, you know, as much as the pandemic was uncertain, the, the future is uncertain and to, you know, overcorrect would be just as big of a mistake. So, you know, I think it's, it's just, you know, we, we probably want to fi focus more on fixing the existing roads while they're less congested, not, not the new roads. Um, Atlanta has been good at, uh, in the past year or so about accommodating miss, missing middle housing. I would expect uh, an influx of people and population growth uh, and to allow for fourplexes and other things in, in places that they previously hadn't been allowed is, uh, is certainly the right direction. Thank you for that. Joel, did you want to give yeah. your take on what you think it's taught us? Well, I think the first thing is that uh, I, I hear the comparison with 9-11 and I actually participated with uh, now Governor Cuomo on what to do with Manhattan afterwards. So I'm pretty familiar with it. Very different situation. Technology, 20 years ago, we didn't have this option. That's probably one of the biggest things. Also, the pandemic is much more universal. The attack on 9-11 was in a very specific place. Um, the pandemic is everywhere. So it, it, you know, it's a little bit different situation, I think, but the key point, and I agree with Adam on this, we have to be flexible. We have to be, take advantage of, of the new technologies and what's now possible. Um, and I think we have to understand also that, you know, pandemics and lockdowns may be not something that we don't see again. Um, you know, a, a, reading history, uh, pandemics tend to come um, on top of each other. They, there seems to be a pattern where there are certain periods where pandemics take place for lots of reasons. Um, I think those may, may be with us. Plus, and you know, people can debate this, um, we have installed so much fear in people that uh, what I wonder is what happens if we have a bad flu season? Will we have another lockdown? This is going, and, and, and lastly, I'm working right now on a survey on the attitudes of millennials and Z's as it's being affected by COVID. And you know, we'll see you know, what, what they have to say, but what I hear from my students is, this has had a profound effect on them, where they're gonna live, how they're gonna live. Um, I hear a lot less people saying, oh, I wanna live in Manhattan, I wanna live in San Francisco. Um, there are more people thinking about smaller cities um, and more dispersed lifestyle. So I think it's going to um, have a big effect over time. Um, this is a, you know, I mean, I remember after 9-11, it was a matter of a few months and then we started kind of getting back to normal, particularly outside of New York. I think it's going to be 
very different because this lockdown and social distancing and masks may be with us for quite a long time. And it may have huge impacts on both business and individual behavior. Berg? Yeah, well, first I'll say I agree with everything Adam and Joel said. I, I think that they're really important. I tend to think COVID is going to be, I don't want to say temporary, but some of the trends are going to, tra are going to start to tick up eventually. Transit use is going to increase. Um, we'll get back to some face-to-face -face contact. Although I agree that it's not going to be like 9-11 where we are almost able to, to flip a switch after a few months. I think a lot of the things are going to be with us. I think we should also keep in mind in Atlanta as we're, we're planning the future that we are not New York or LA um, or a certain type of metro area that is probably most comparable to Dallas or even Phoenix. And maybe if you want a regional competitor, Charlotte, but Charlotte is much smaller than Atlanta. So we'll be careful with that one a little bit. Uh, and we need to think about how people are actually living. And as Joel pointed out, um, we were switching to more suburban, uh, more work from home even before COVID. And so even if we, we uh, snap our fingers and COVID goes away pretty quickly, we're still gonna have those trends. And so what we need to change in terms of land use, in terms of the zoning, in terms of transportation, uh, it's, it's, we're headed toward more decentralization, whether it's a lot more or a little more, that's the direction we're going. Dallas? Well, you know, I think it's going to be very interesting to see um, one, again, I'm unique. We're in Atlanta and Atlanta is doing a lot of things right. I think uh, when we talk about the belt line and just connectivity to a lot of the trails uh, with trying to put people more on uh, being less uh, uh, tied to having to be in an automobile all the time. And I think that's a trend that I'm glad to see. Uh, I think it's good for the environment, good for our health, um, all of that. And so, and I think we're going to see more of that, of that happening in pockets. I've seen, you know, Buckhead has their own trail, Cobb has some trails. I mean, so I think this connectivity thing with us getting back outside, and, um, like, you know, I tell my daughter all the time, when I was a little kid, we actually went outside and actually played. I mean, it was, <laughs> um, you know, it, it, was, it, it wasn't one of these things sitting here doing this all day. So I, I think if 2020 doesn't do anything else, I think, you know, 2020 represents perfect eyesight, right? So I think 2020 is a year that we're all going to see things very clear, very clearly in terms of how they've impacted us, whether it's racial unrest, um, political issues. Uh, I think we're going to come out of this year seeing things a lot more clear, whether we want to see it or not. Uh, but uh, just, you know, don't turn a blind eye. You know, we got to you know, take these things, take the bull by the horn and, and deal with all these issues. And I think we're a unique generation. Uh, the, the six of us that I see on the, on, the, on the screen, we all get through this. I think we all should get S's tatted, tatted on our chest because we're all super, super people to get through this. You know, we've gone through environmental issues, now pandemics, and we get through this. You know, everybody should get an award, I'm telling you. So. <laughs> <laughs> So Dallas, you don't see the, the young, younger folks moving out of Atlanta for smaller cities? No, I, I see kind of just the opposite. Uh, in my office, I've got 20 uh, folks and majority of them are younger people. Uh, most of them are moving in the cities. Uh, the, the guys that have, and gals that have more money, they're moving in the cities and having a place out um, in, the, in the mountains and the cabins and that kind of thing. But we're, I'm seeing just a lot of, I'm trying to return back in the city. I'm six miles from the city now. And my wife thinks we live in the suburbs. So, uh, <laughs> because our old commute was three blocks to my office. And so, you know, so six miles seems, but you know, it's, it's really, at the end of the day, it's really all relative, right? That's right. Um, I think Adam mentioned about just, you know, ha having that Starbucks next door, the, the kind of things that, you know, these creature comforts that we get used to. And the older I get, the more I want to have those types of creature, creature comforts. I'll be 58 in 19 days. So um, the, the most I want to do right now is to reach for the remote from my easy chair. Um, <laughs> and so <laughs> if it's not along that theme, then it's kind of, it's, you know, too much. So I, so I want everything in town. So I want to be in town. Um, when I lived in town, I, we could walk to 53 restaurants. Um, and so uh, my wife's willing to give up the car to do that. So I think, I, for, for, I think it's all relative, kind of where you are in life. 
uh, you know, it's, you know, it's how you're going to make your decisions. Tom, what about your perspective? Sure. No, I, I think, uh, certainly it's taught us, uh, and we've heard it on this webinar. I'll say it, I'll say it again, but just be flexible and stay flexible. Um, seems to be, seems to be the mantra, you know, and, and in the world of capital planning and capital programming, um, you know, being flexible with, with priorities and, and what, uh, what factors go into setting, uh, those priorities. Uh, I mean, rural broadband, is that more valuable at this point than another capital project? Um, you know, are we, you know, we all have, have heard and many of us have executed scenario based planning, but this is a, this is quite a unique scenario. Um, but, you know, thinking about ways in which to go about um, go about that as we move forward, um, just being and staying uh, flexible. Very good. Well, thank you guys, Kyle, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Something just popped up. In the I am still here. Yeah, I, I okay. was uh, <laughs> listening throughout to that great conversation. So uh, thanks, everybody on the panel. That was really, uh, really great. Very interesting. Uh, great way that in the spirit of this event to kind of take what's going on now, how we're adapting now, and what that's going to mean long term uh, for our, uh, you know, for our state and, and the people who are in it. Um, so thanks very much for that. Um, do want to uh, thank our sponsors one more time. Let me see how I can. Uh, actually, have a slide here to show. I believe. Can y'all see it? Okay. So, mm -hmm. presenting sponsor AT and T, our platinum sponsors, Verizon and the Walton Family Foundation, and our silver sponsor, the Georgia Association of Realtors. Um, Please join us next week as we continue exploring adaptation uh, with a look at a subject of obvious importance, the economy. Uh, that session will begin at 11 a.m. next Tuesday, August 11th, and we hope you'll all be able to join us for that. Until then, thank you for being with us today, and we're adjourned.